Um, so uh, I just want to welcome everyone to this Q&A session um, for the Social Data School 2021. My name is Anne Alexander. I'm Director of Learning at Cambridge Digital Humanities, uh, which is uh, we're the organisation that kind of initiated the data schools. Um, and we're doing this one in partnership with the Mindaroo Centre for Technology and Democracy. Um, my colleague Hugo Leal is going to tell us a bit about that. Um, I'm also very pleased that um, we've got on the call, um, obviously Heather, who uh, welcomed you into the into the session. Heather's helping with the admin for the for the data school, and um, Andrea Coxis, who's a member of the teaching team. Um, we're hoping we might be joined by um, another member of the teaching team, Jennifer Cobb, um, who will hopefully be popping along later. Um, as uh, we explained, really in the sort of uh, background to this session. Um, we are running a live Q and A, um, live Q and A session uh, to allow people who are interested in applying for the Social Data School um, to uh, get a sense of uh, what it is that we're looking for in terms of applications. To ask us questions about anything that might not be clear in the um, uh, in, in the details that we've put online. Um, I just want to make everyone aware that we've pressed the recording button because we are planning to record just the. Um, uh, uh, contributions from the teaching team so we can put this up online. We won't be recording any of your questions uh, or anything or, or anything like that. We'll only be using the um, uh, what we're doing in terms of uh, uh, the uh, presentations, if you like. Um, what I thought I would do is go through a quick presentation, which I hope will um, go through some of the basics. Um, which uh, will then give you, hopefully answer some of the questions that you might have, but then you can obviously come back to, to that if there's anything that isn't clear. So I'm gonna have a go at um, sharing my screen now. Hang on, let me just uh, do that. Right. Uh, oh, sorry, um, Heather, can you, um, can you make me a co-host so that I can share my screen, please? Uh, sorry, yes, I've just done that. So um, hopefully, can everybody see my presentation? Yes, great. Um, so just very brief background. Um, the CDH data schools have objectives which are focused on democratizing access to tools and methods for um, digital data collection, analysis and reporting. So anything that is using large amounts of data to try and understand what's going on in the world. Uh, we have an interest in fostering development of ethical practices in digital research and to encourage dialogue between people who may be often using very similar sets of tools and methods, but in different kind of professional contexts or different social uh, and uh, professional contexts. So in academia, civil society, the public sector, uh, the media and so on. Um, and this is very much a, a, a set of, uh, of training courses that are focused on learning practical skills and knowledge exchange. Um, this particular edition, if you like, of the data schools, the social data school, is led by Cambridge Digital Humanities, where I work, and we're very pleased to be working with the Mindaroo Centre for Technology and Democracy. Um, and Hugo is going to say a little bit more about the Mindaroo Centre, where that's coming from, and uh, what the partnership means. Um, in terms of who we're hoping might apply for this, um, we've put I've I've put really three categories of people here, and I'll just say something briefly about the about this to give uh, give you an idea. Um, it's not an exhaustive or exclusive list. We're happy to take applications from from anyone, um, but there are certain groups of people who we think would particularly likely to benefit from uh, from the content of the school. One group of people is media workers, so. Uh, thinking potentially, largely those might be journalists, um, but also potentially people in editorial roles or maybe in a more kind of data science or technology um, uh, service type role. Um, when we say journalist, we don't mean that you have to be a paid member of staff um, or you could be a freelancer, you could be working unpaid as a journalist, uh, however you might describe, describe yourself. Um, People working with NGOs, non-governmental organisations and civil, organize, civil society organisations are another category of people we think might benefit. Uh, we're thinking particularly of cases where 
uh, advocacy or campaigning might rely on data intensive research. Um, also those who are interested in exploring um, campaigning around issues related to the applications of digital technologies in, in, in society. Um, we have a broad definition around NGOs and, so, uh, and, and, and campaigns, so not just in the sphere of human rights, but also thinking, for example, trade unionists are very welcome to apply, uh, people involved in, envir in environmental campaigning, um, a whole range and gamut of, uh, of different types of organisations. Um, and again, it doesn't have to be a funded organisation. Paid staff, uh, if you're involved as a volunteer, the community will come from an unfunded group. And as, as you'll see in our pricing structure for the contribution we ask towards the, um, for part from participants, that if you are in an unfunded group, then your um, uh, it, it, the, the, then there's a, a much lower rate to pay than you would if you were in a paid uh, in a paid role. Um, we're happy to take applications from researchers and research students, though I would say we'll prioritise applications from those who don't have access to this type of training through from other means. So for, if you already have access to a research methods training programme as a student in your own institution, we're very unlikely to, uh, to take your application. Um, colleagues who might be applying uh, from any of these categories, say in the uh, from the Global South, um, would be likely to get priority under the sort of scoring system that we have for our, for our applications. Um, <clears throat> if you're again, if you're a researcher and a research student, we are more likely to prioritise your application uh, or accept your application if you're engaged with or working with the media, civil society organisations or, or NGOs. So that if the application of these methods is only in an academic context, we think that there are other places where you would be, uh, you'd be better suited to get this kind of training. Um, as I said, we're keen to see applications from around the world. Um, the live sessions which are taking place will be running in a kind of time window um, in, the, in the afternoon on British summer time from about 1.30 p.m. to about 4 p.m. Um, and as I said, we particularly encourage applications from uh, people in the, in the global south. Um, the costs, again, are on our website. We have a standard, a standard rate. Uh, which is 245 pounds. If you're from a small organization or say you're a member of university staff or in a, in a staff journalist role, then it's a lower rate. And then uh, many people would be paying the, uh, uh, the least rate. And we do have a bursary scheme. Um, you'll be asked if you apply to indicate if you would like to be sent data, if you would like to um, uh, apply, for a, apply for a bursary. Um, we're not going to say too much at this point exactly about the the, uh, the content of the programme because you'll hear a little bit from the or uh, uh, the teaching team about the content of their mo of their uh, uh, of their modules. But we start off with a module on ethical re digital research design and the digital project lifecycle, which I lead. Um, Jennifer will be then covering uh, data protection and surveillance in the network world. We'll have spaces throughout where we'll be discussing mach how machine learning shapes the media. Then we have uh, content around data exploration, structuration and preparation, social network visualization and analysis, machine learning and computer vision, uh, a critical and experimental introduction. Again, that's one of the modules that I'm, uh, I'm leading and I will say a little bit more about that later. Um, in terms of the time commitment, we expect that um, the actual live sessions themselves are around for, it's about 14 hours in total over two, over two weeks. Um, there's also, we'd expect that there'd be an additional around one to two hours work, uh, uh, work of self-paced uh, doing exercises and, and working through materials related to the sessions. I mean, you can expand that. So the course materials will include links to further tutorials and resources that you can access online. Um, but we're trying to pitch it at a level where it's not meant to be a full time programme, um, that people can fit it around to a certain extent around other commitments. But it's a relatively intense time commitment. Um, and we think that people will get most out of it if they're able to have a, a, a decent amount of time to be able to work through the materials while they have the access to the live support uh, and, and so on. Um, please feel free to ask in the questions about this kind of teaching delivery delivery methods um, and anything you'd like to know about that when we get to the questions. Uh, we will also have a public event which is going to take place on the afternoon of the 22nd of June, which if you're a data school participant for the main data school you'll be able to, you'll get a priority to book for, but that will actually be open to anyone. 
Um, technical requirements, you need to have uh, a, an internet connection that's able to do stable video calls. Um, we've tried to keep the actual requirements to be live online relatively small amount of time. Um, you'd need to have a laptop or a desktop on which you can install software. This is quite important if you were attempt going to take part in the programme from a work, uh, you know, using a work device, you need to make sure in advance that you're able to install the software that's needed. Um, the main software is the software that we're using is all free to use um, and some of it's open source. I put a list there and it's also on the website, but it'd be Zoom for the actual video conferencing, the live, uh, live teaching sessions, followed by using Voyant for text visualization, Open Refine for data cleaning, Gephi for social network visualization analysis, and uh, Jupyter Notebooks for web scraping. You'll also need a Google, a Google account for using Google Colab Notebooks. Um, most of these, obviously, we can't give you intensive support in terms of installation, but most of these software are relatively straightforward to install. And we will offer some uh, remote technical support to try and get people over any humps and hurdles in terms of um, in terms of installation. Um, as I said, we're going to go move on to the other members of the teaching team in a minute, but I'm Anne Alexander um, and uh, Jennifer Cobb is teaching our sessions on uh, data, data protection and surveillance. Um, and, and Andrea and Hugo will introduce themselves in a minute. Um, that's me done. Um, and uh, I think I'll hand over, uh, hand over to Hugo to take, it, to take up and to introduce uh, also the Mindaroo Center. Thank you, Anne. Hi all, my name is uh, Uliel. Uh, I'm a research associate at the Mindrew Center for Technology and Democracy, as Anne said. Uh, the Mindrew Center uh, is the Cambridge node of the sort of international network of academic programs and, and centers that were established primarily to push back against this dominant narratives and practices by big tech to the detriment of, of citizens uh, and democracies. Um, I am with Anne Alexander, uh, part of the team who created this concept of a new type of, of data school from Cambridge, but not restricted to uh, academics. I coordinated the initiative in its various shapes uh, until last year, but as it happens, but not coincidentally, the original goals of this social data school are very much aligned um, with those of the Minzeru Center for Technology and Democracy, like enhancing public understanding of digital uh, technologies and building journalistic capacity to answer questions with, with data and ask questions to and about data. So we thought it made sense to kind of join forces and resources uh, to co-organize this year's uh, edition. And as I remember, a small disclaimer, I might be romanticizing it, the guiding principle at the beginning was removing barriers, uh, removing the entry barrier to data science by showing an easy way in that will make our task and collective duty even, I would say, of reclaiming our data much easier. Um, then also removing barriers, separating academics from others and, and try to build bridges across sectors. Uh, this is not about um, having scholars dismounting from the high horse to share some knowledge crumbs with the public or descending from the ivory tower to enlighten the public as outreach is normally conceived, but rather is an exercise to criticize, produce, exchange knowledge. We, we share a space, this year is a virtual one. Um, we share the experience of the participants that ideally come from very diverse backgrounds a mixture of that and regions. And we share experiments with, uh, with data. And this year, considering the, the limitations, I think the various modules are very well integrated. And at the end, we'll have multiple perspectives and more knowledge about what I call the appropriation or reappropriation of data extraction and analysis for the common good rather than just private profit. Um, maybe I'll, I can talk already a bit about my model, my, my module. Uh, 
because my module speaks directly to that goal in, in the sense that we will be discussing data collection practices and then practicing digital data collection. So more specifically, we'll harvest some data from social media platforms, wrangle it, that is we will explore, structure, clean data, and then uh, analyze it with a widely popular, but I would say widely used method called social network analysis and misused. Um, but when properly used actually, it can give you both a, a general view or overview of the structural properties of uh, networks. Think of disinformation networks, uh, uh, for example, but also allows you to zoom in and inquire some of the uh, uh, actors and the properties of the networks qualitatively. So it's all about digging in and, and getting our hands dirty this is part of the whole uh, data school uh, experience that I've been calling a data stroll, not a data sprint. And you should have a bunch of coders trying to solve a problem, but a more contemplative exercise almost in which we, we traverse this field of data science from a critical, uh, relaxed, and hopefully fun uh, perspective. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Hugo. Um, so actually, I, I think maybe the best thing is now if we pass over to Andrea. Um, Andrea, if you'd like to introduce your, yourself and tell us a bit about the module that you're going to be teaching. Hi, I am Andrea Kotisch. I'm a Methods Fellow at the Cambridge Digital Humanities and I'm finishing my PhD in Cambridge while I work for the National Archives um, as a data cleaner. Um, and the aim of my module is to give an entry level introduction uh, into what to do with data if you don't have coding or a data science background. So the aim of my module is to demystify um, all, all, the, all the surroundings of data cleaning. And therefore I aim to let you drive a project with the least possible amount of coding um, and we will do it based on um, a fake news. So we will use a freely available fake news collection uh, of BuzzFeed. And you can, uh, I will show you a way of how to easily, quickly uh, organize, clean and reconcile data uh, uh, with the use of OpenRefine, which is a freely available open uh, source uh, tool and it's very powerful. And that way we will have a tiny look into how to modify large batches of data with just tiny few wording codes uh, within OpenRefine. And the end result we will export and we are going to run some visualizations and text analysis on them to, to cover what type of topics were popular what time uh, in this database. And we will do it with Voyant tools. Um, Moyan tools uh, is a very good introduction into uh, the so-called natural language processing and textual analysis, which we are going to learn, because you can learn the jargon um, of these methods without actually writing a line of code. So you can understand how uh, these processes go, what are in the backgrounds, what are stop words, what are topics, um, what are clustering, but, but still, uh, when you step to the uh, next step, then you start to do it by yourself, by coding, you will be familiar uh, with what are these processes and how they work and you won't be scared of it anymore. So we will do a bit of uh, topic modeling there and visualizing uh, these. And by the end, when we are, we are very comfortable uh, with moving around these techniques, uh, we will dive into um, adding more data to our collection uh, with the help of a few line coding uh, in Python language. Um, they, and I can introduce you to how to make it trackable uh, with the use of uh, Jupyter notebooks. And we will add a bit of information from the web free, freely parsed into our database. And your task will be just to, um, by the end, show your understanding 
on this fake news collection. We can look for uh, topics like uh, what are the main articles, what named entities, persons, geographical places uh, are mentioned um, in these articles, uh, how many times, what, what uh, articles were the most shared on Facebook, um, uh, what time frame they are coming from. So there are a lot of interesting questions we can build our story on or our narrative, but the main thing is that we are trying to uh, just enter the world of data cleaning and understanding and visualize, visualizing. Fantastic, thanks very much, Andrea. Um, I think uh, also Jennifer is here actually. So um, Jennifer, is it all right if we pass over to you to introduce yourself? Yes, that's fine, thank you very much. Um, I should say my webcam is not working properly. So I'm kind of stuck at this like, disembodied voice, but uh, that'll have to do for now. Um, so I'll be taking a, a, a module on a sort of data protection and surveillance in a network world. I'm thinking about um, some of the different pitfalls and, and risks of collecting data from a sort of a legal point of view, from a sort of more critical point of view. I'm thinking about questions of power and, and, and different kind of dynamics that go on there. Um, we'll be looking at sort of data protection basics, but not from a sort of jurisdiction specific kind of way, because of course it's not just in Europe that we have data protection law, it's in many other jurisdictions, but the basic principles are the same uh, generally across different countries. So we'll be looking at, at those kind of basic ideas and, and what the purpose of, of data protection is um, and how you can kind of leverage things like subject access requests to try to get data from, from organisations to try to understand uh, what they're doing. Um, and then a slightly more critical take on the questions of, of sort of data collection and analysis and issues around surveillance and business models of, of, of sort of data of uh, surveillance companies and, and that kind of thing. And obviously the question as well of how data collection feeds into potentially state surveillance and intelligence and security uh, programs. And we'll be talking about things like the power dynamics that, that are inherent in all of these kind of questions around data collection uh, and use. Um, and using you know, some real world examples to try to illustrate that. Um, and I think what I'm going to be doing then between the first class and the second class is setting a sort of bit of work for, for, for you to go off and do where you'll be given some sort of specific examples of potentially problematic or, or real world kind of uh, systems or services or time, types of data collection that to go, to go away and really critically interrogate and then come back to the second class. I have some short presentations of just a few minutes at a time to try to give us your thinking on, on your sort of critical, critical take on these things about the implications of this kind of data analysis and data collection. I'll talk about what, what, what you've learned from this. Um, which we'll then sort of use as, as a sort of a jumping off point for sort of a, a much sort of broader group discussion about these issues and, and try to tie these threads um, together. Um, so hopefully it'll give us uh, something of a sort of more critical take grounded to an extent in the law around these kind of issues and hopefully that will be, um, be useful and interesting and should inform some of the thinking for the other modules as well. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Sorry about the um, confusion about the uh, naming. I'm not quite sure what happened there. Um, I would just um, say a couple of words about the uh, modules, the other module that I'm teaching, um, which is I will be doing some work introducing people to a kind of hands on approach to uh, looking at applications in machine learning, but without again needing to be able to write code or to have an advanced uh, knowledge of the of the maths involved. Um, so this is very much looking at for in two uh, two areas potentially um, image processing, so kind of computer vision tasks, which are fundamental to uh, a lot of applications, both in kind of media context in terms of um, object detection and, and identifying objects and people, facial recognition and so on in um, uh, working with large amounts of digital data um, in uh, say the in, in entertainment and the media, but also have many applications in other in other contexts uh, in terms of surveillance and uh, crime, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so what we try and do is actually go under the hood of machine learning systems that work in this way and um, provide you with some tools that allow you to experiment in with 
um, finding out what some of the problems are in terms of how these systems work. Well, also, if we, are, if we have time, we'll also look a bit at text generation, which again is another area which is rapidly advancing in terms of machine learning and is likely to have um, significant impact on how the media functions and is also having a potentially have a very significant kind of cultural impact over the next few years.